So, Hare Krishna. Let me know if you can hear me. Yes, Prabhuji, I, I can hear you. Nice. I mean, I was expecting that not everyone can join today, mainly because uh, today is um, already holiday season started. Give me two more minutes. Yeah, okay, Prabhuji. Um, I want to share this link to Chirag Prabhu. I think we we are in chapter 19, if I remember. Yeah? Yes, Prabhuji. Uh, because last chapter you broke it into two parts, right? Uh, yeah. You want I can check that quickly because I remember I think breaking ground was yes yeah last time we read chapter 18 so let's begin with chapter 19 Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Salakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Gena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Mena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Gata Mahyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Yuta Padakamalan Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savat Utam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Anvitam Shcha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristhaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhaktivedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Pashyat Yadi Satarine Vanchakal Patarabhyas Chakrapa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavan Ebhyo Vaishnav Ebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Reading from Sri La Prabhupada Lila Amrath Volume 1 Chapter 19 Planting the Seed Does what you told us this morning Howard asked mean we are supposed to accept the spiritual master to be God. That means he is due the same respect as God, being God's representative. Prabhupada replied calmly, then he is not God. No, Prabhupada said, God is God. The spiritual master is his representative. Therefore, he is as good as God because he can deliver God to the sincere disciple. Is that clear? From Dialogue with Hayagriv, August 1966. It was makeshift. A storefront turned temple and a two-room apartment transformed into Guru's residence and study, but it was complete nonetheless. It was a complete monastery amid the city slums. The temple, the storefront, was quickly becoming known among the hip underground of Lower East Side. The courtyard was a strangely peaceful place for aspiring monks with its little garden, bird sanctuary, and trees squeezed in between the front and the rear buildings, the Swami's back room was the inner sanctum of the monastery. Each room had a flavor all its own, or rather, it took on its particular character from the Swami's activities there. The temple room was his kirtan and lecture hall. The lecture was always serious and formal, even from the beginning when there was no dayas and he had to sit on a straw mat facing a few guests. It was clear he was here to instruct, not to invite casual give and take dialogue. Questions had to wait until he finished speaking. The audience would sit on the floor and listen for 45 minutes as he delivered the Vedic knowledge intact always speaking on the basis of Vedic authority, quoting Sanskrit, quoting the previous spiritual masters, delivering perfect knowledge, supported with reason and argument. While contending with noises of street, he lectured with exacting scholarship and deeply committed devotion. 
it appeared that he had long ago mastered all the references and conclusions of his predecessors and had even come to anticipate all intellectual challenges he also held kirtans in the storefront like the lectures the kirtans were serious but there was not so formal they were not so formal propad was lenient during kirtan visitors would bring harmoniums wooden flutes guitars and they would follow the melody or create their own improvisation someone brought an old string bass and bow and an inspired guest could always pick up the bow and play along some of the boys had found the innards of an uproot uh, upright piano waiting on the curb with someone's garbage and they had brought it to the temple and placed it near the entrance during a kirtan free willing guests uh, would run their hands over the wires creating strange vibrations robert nelson several weeks back had brought a large cymbal that now hung from the ceiling dangling close by the swami's dayas but there was a limit to the extravagance sometimes when a newcomer picked up the kartals and played them in a beat other than that standard 1 2 3 swami ji would ask one of the boys to correct him even at the risk of offending the guest prabhupad led the chanting and drummed with one hand on a small bongo even on this a little bongo drum he played Bhag- uh, bengali mridanga rhythm so interesting that a local congo drummer used to come just to hear the swami gets in some good licks the swami's kirtans were a high a new high and the boys would glance at each other with widening eyes and shaking ha- heads as they responded to his chanting comparing it to their previous drug experiences and signaling each other favorably this is great it's better than lsd hey man i am really getting high on this and propad encouraged their new found intoxication as master of these kirtan kirtanas he was also acting expertly as guru lord chaitanya had said there are no hard and fast rules for chanting the holy name and propad brought the chanting to the lower east side just that way a kindergarten of spiritual life he once called the temple here he taught the abc's of krishna consciousness lecturing from bhagavad gita and leading the group chanting of hare krishna sometimes after the fi- uh, final kirtan he would invite those who were interested to join him for further talks in his ap- apartment in the back room of his apartment propad was usually alone especially in the early morning hours 2 3 or 4 am when almost no one else was awake in these early hours his room was silent and he worked alone in the intimacy of his relationship with krishna he would sit on the floor behind his suitcase desk worshiping krishna by typing the translation and purports of his shrimad bhagavatam but the same back room was also used for meetings and anyone who brought himself to knock on swami's door could enter and speak with him at any time face to face propad would sit back from his typewriter and give his time to talking listening answering questions sometimes arguing or joking a visitor might sit alone with him for half an hour before someone else would knock and swami ji would invite the newcomer to join them new guests would come and others would go but swami ji stayed and sat and talked generally visitors were formal his guests would also ask philosophical questions and he would answer much the same as after a lecture in the storefront but occasionally some of the boys who were becoming serious followers would monopolize his time especially on tuesday thursday saturday and sunday nights when there was no evening lecture in the temple often they would ask him personal questions what was it like when he came to new york what about india did he had followers there were his family members devotees of krishna what was his spiritual master like and then propad would talk in a different way quieter more intimate and humorous he took he told now sorry he told how one morning in new york he had first seen snow and thought someone who had white washed the buildings he told how he had spoken at several churches in butler and when the boys asked what kind of churches they were he smiled and replied i don't know and they laughed with him he would reminisce freely about the british control of india and about indian politics he told them it was not so much gandhi as subhas chandra bose who had liberated india subhas chandra bose had gone outside of india and started the indian national army he entered into an argument with hitler that indian soldiers fighting for british india 
who suffered to the germans could be returned to indian national army to fight against the british and it was this show of force by bose more than gandhi's non violence which led to india's independence he talked of his childhood at the turn of the century when street lamps were gas lit and carriages and horse drawn trams were the only vehicles on calcutta's dusty streets these talks charmed the boys even more than the transcendental philosophy of bhagavad gita and drew them affectionately to him he told about his father gaur mohan de a pure vaishnav his father had been a cloth merchant and his family had been Im- intimately uh, related with the aristocratic mulics of calcutta the mulics had a deity of krishna and proper's father had given him a deity to worship as a child he used to imitate the worship of govinda deity in the mulik's temple as a uh, boy he had held his own rathayatra festival each year imitating in miniature the gigantic festival at jagannath puri and his father's friends used to joke oh the rathayatra ceremony is going on at your home and you do not invite us what is this his father would reply this is a child's play that's all but the neighbor said oh child's play you are avoiding us by saying it's for chi- children propat fondly remembered his father who had never wanted him to be a worldly man who had given him lessons in mridanga and who had prayed to visiting sadhus that one day the boy would grow up to be a devotee of radha rani one night he told how he had met his spiritual master he told how he had begun his own chemical business but had left home and in 1959 had taken sanyas the boys were interested but so ignorant of that things prabhupad was talking about that at the mention of a word like mridanga or sanyas they would have to ask what it meant and he would go on conversational tangents describing indian spices indian drums even indian women and whatever he spoke about he would eventually shine upon it the light of the shastra he did not rationalize out such talk but gave it out uh, abundantly by the hour day after day as long as there were uh, uh, there was a real live inquirer at noon the front room became a dining hall and in the evening a play, evenings a place of intimate worship propad had kept the room with its 12 foot square hardwood uh, parquet floor clean and bare the solitary coffee table against the wall between the two co- courtyard windows was the only furniture daily at noon a dozen men were now taking lunch here with him the meal was cooked by keith who spent the whole morning in the kitchen At first Keith had cooked only for the swami he had mastered the art of cooking dal rice and sabji in the swami's three tiered boiler and usually there uh, had been enough for one or two guests as well but soon more guests had begun to gather and propad had told keith to increase the quantity abandoning the small three tiered cooker until he was cooking for a dozen hungry men the boarders rafael and don do not so interested in swami stocks would arrive punctually each day for prashadam usually with a friend or two who had wandered into the store front steve would drop by from his job at the welfare office the mott street group would come and there were others the kitchen was stocked with standard indian spices fresh chilies fresh ginger root whole cumin seeds turmeric and asafoetida Keith mastered the basic cooking techniques and passed them on to Chuck who became his assistant some of the other boys would stand at doorway of narrow kitchenet to watch Keith as one thick uh, pan- pancake like chapati after another blew up like an inflated football over the open flame and then uh, took its place in the steaming steak while the fine basmati rice boiled to a moist fluffy white finish and the sabji simmered the noon cooker cooking would climax with the uh, chons keith prepared the chons exactly as swami ji had shown him uh, chas over the flame he set a small metal cup half filled with clarified butter and then put in cumin seeds when the seeds turned almost black he added chilies and as chilies blackened a choking smoke began to pour from the cup now the chok was ready with his cook's tongs keith lifted the cup 
it's boiling cr uh, crackling mixture fuming like a sorcerer's kettle and uh, brought it to the edge of the pot of boiling dal he opened the tight cover slightly dumped the boiling chalk into the dal with a flick of his wrist and immediately replaced the lid puff the meeting of the chalk and dal created an explosion which was then greeted by cheers from the doorway signifying that the cooking was now complete this final operation was so volatile that it once blew the top of the pot to the ceiling with a loud smash causing minor burns to uh, keith's hand some of the neighbors complained of acrid penetrating fumes but the devotees loved it when lunch was ready swami ji would wash his hands and mouth in the bathroom and come out into the front room his soft pink buttoned feet always bare his saffron dhoti reaching down to his ankles he would stand by the coffee table which held the picture of lord chaitanya and his associates while his own associates stood around him uh, against the walls keith would bring uh, in a big tray of chapatis staked by dozens and place it on the floor before the altar table along with pots of rice dal and sabji swami ji would then recite the bengali prayer for offering the food to the lord and up all present would follow him by bowing down knees and head to the floor and approximating the bengali prayer one word at a time while the steam and mixed aromas drifted up like an offering of incense uh, before the picture of lord chaitanya the swamis follow a board their heads to the wooden floor and mumbled the prayer propa then sat with his friends eating the same prasadam as they with the addition of a banana and a metal bowl full of hot milk he would slice the banana by pushing it downwards against the edge of the bowl letting the slices fall into the hot milk propa's open decree that uh, everyone should eat as much prasadam as possible created a humorous mood and a family feeling no one was allowed simply to sit picking at his food nibbling uh, nibbling po politely they ate with uh, gusty swami ji almost insisted upon if he saw someone not eating heartily he would call the person's name and smilingly protest why are you not eating take prasadam and he would laugh when i was coming out to your country on the boat he said i thought how will the americans ever eat this food and the boys pushed their plates forward for more keith would serve seconds more rice dal chapati and sabji after all it was spiritual you were supposed to eat a lot uh, it would purify you it would free you from maya besides it was good delicious and spicy this was better than american food it was like chanting it was far out you got you got high from eating this food they uh, ate with the right hand indian style keith and howard had already learned this and had even tasted similar dishes but as they told the swami and the room full of believers the food in india had never been this good one boy uh, stanley was quite young and prabhupad almost like a doting father watched over him as he ate Stanley's mother had personally met Prabhupada and said that only if he took personal care of her son would she allow him to live in the monastery. Prabhupada com com complied. He diligently encouraged the boy until Stanley gradually took on a voracious appetite and began consuming 10 chapatis at a sitting and would have taken more had Swami ji had uh, Swami ji not told him to stop. but aside from swami ji's limiting stanley to 10 chapatis the word was always more take more when propad was finished he would raise and leave the room keith would catch a couple of volunteers to help him clean and others would leave occasionally on sunday propad himself would cook a feast with special indian dishes steve swami ji personally cooked the prasadam and then served it to us upstairs in his front room we all sat in rows and i remember him walking up and down in between the rows of boys passing before us with the, his bare foot and serving up serving us with a spoon from different pots 
he would ask uh, what did we want but we would more of of this uh, did did we want more of this and he would serve us with pleasure these dishes were not ordinary but sweets and savious like sweet rice and kachoris with special taste even after we had all taken a full plate he would come back and ask us to take more once he came up to me and asked what i would like more of would i like some more sweet rice in my early misconception of spiritual life i thought i should deny myself what i liked best so i asked for some more plain rice but even that plain rice was fancy yellow rice with fried cheese balls on off nights his apartment was quiet he might remain alone for the whole evening typing and translating shrimad bhagavatam or trying in a relaxed atmosphere to just one or two guests until 10 but on meeting nights mon- monday wednesday and friday there was activity in every room of his apartment he wasn't alone uh, anymore his new followers were helping him and they shared in his spirit of trying to get people to chant hare krishna and hear of the conscious krishna consciousness in the back room he worked on his translation of bhagavatam or spoke with guests up until 6 when he would go to take his bath sometimes he would have to wait until the bathroom was free he had introduced his young followers to the practice of taking two baths a day and now he ha- he wa- he was sometimes inconvenienced by having to share his bathroom after his bathroom uh, would come into the front after his bath he would come into the front room um, where his assembled followers would sit around him he would sit on a mat facing his picture of the panchatatva and after putting a few drops of water in his left palm from a small metal spoon and bowl he would rub a lump of rindavan clay in the water making a wet paste he would then apply the clay markings of vaishnava tilak uh, dipping into the yellowish paste in his left hand with ring finger of his right he would scrap wet uh, clay from his palm and while looking into a small mirror which he uh, deftly uh, between the he held deftly between the thumb and pinky of his uh, left hand he would mark a vertical clay strip up his forehead and then trim the clay into two parallel lines by placing the little finger of his right hand between his eyebrows and running it upward past the hairline clearing a path into in the still moisture clay then he marked 11 other places on his body while the boys sat observing sometimes asking questions or sometimes speaking their own understandings of krishna consciousness prabhupad my guru maharaj used to put on tilak without a mirror did it come out neat devotee asked prabhupad neat or not neat that does not matter yes it was also neat prabhupad would then silently recite the gayatri mantra holding his brahmana sacred thread and looping it around his right thumb he would sit erect silently moving his lips his bare shoulders and arms were quite thin as was his chest but he had a round slightly protruded belly his complexion was as satiny smooth as a young boy's except for his face which bore signs of age the movements of his hands were methodic methodical aristocratic yet delicate he picked up two brass bells in his left hand and began ringing them then lighting two sticks of incense from the candle near the picture of lord chaitanya his and his associates he began waving the incense slowly in small circles before lord chaitanya while still ringing the bells he looked briefly at the picture and continued cutting spirals of uh, continued cutting spirals of fragrant smoke all the while ringing the bells none of the boys knew what he was doing although he did it every evening but it was a ceremony it meant something the boy began to call the ceremony bells after bells monday wednesday and friday it would usually be time for evening kirtan some of the devotees would already be downstairs greeting guests and explaining about the swami and the chanting but without the swami nothing could begin no one knew how to sing or drum and no one dared thinking of leading the mantra chanting without him only when he entered at 7 o'clock could they begin 
freshly showered and dressed in the in his clean indian hand woven cloth his arms and body decorated with the arrow like vaishnava marking propad would leave his apartment and go downstairs to the fa- to face another er- ecstatic opportunity to glorify krishna the tiny temple would be crowded with wild unbrahmanical candid young americans dawn was a test of swamiji's tolerance he had lived in the storefront for months working little and not trying to change his habits he had a remarkable speech affect affectation instead of talking he enunciated his words as if he were reciting them from a book and he never used contractions it wasn't that he was intellectual just that somehow he had developed a plan plan to abolish his natural dialect don's speech struck people as bizarre like it might be the result of two year, uh, many drugs it began it gave him the air of being not an ordinary being and he continuous continuously took mariana even after swami ji had asked those who lived with him not to sometimes during the day his girlfriend would join him in the store front and they would sit together talking intimately and sometimes kissing but he liked the swami he even gave some money once he liked the living in the store front and swami ji didn't complain but others did one day an interesting newcomer dropped by the store front and found don alone surrounded by sharp aroma of marijuana you been smoking pot but the swami doesn't want anyone smoking here don denied it i have not been smoking you are not speaking the truth the boy then reached in don's shirt pocket and pulled out a joint and uh, don hit him in the face several of the boys found out they weren't sure what was right what would the swami do what do you do if someone smokes pot even though a devotee was not supposed to could it be allowed sometimes they put the matter before swami ji propad took it very seriously and he was upset especially about the violence uh, he hit you he asked the boy i will go down myself and kick him in the head but then propad thought about it and said that don should be asked to leave but don had already left the next morning during swami ji's class don appeared at the front door from his dais swami ji looked out at don with great concern but his first concern was for iskon ask him propas requested roy who sat nearby if he has mariana then he cannot come in our society propas was like an anxious father afraid of the life of his infant iskon roy went to the door and told don he would have to give up his drugs if he entered and don walked away rafael was not interested in spiritual discipline he was a tall young man with long straight brown uh, hair who like don tried to stay aloof and casual toward swami ji when propad introduced japa and encouraged the boys to chant during the day rafael didn't go for it he said he liked a good kirtan but he wouldn't chant on the beats one day one time swami ji was locked out of his apartment and the boys had to break the lock swami ji asked rafael to replace it days went by rafael could sit in the store front reading uh, rimbaud rim he could wander around town but he couldn't find time to fix the lock one evening he dropped by the swami's apartment opened the lockless door and made his way to the back room where some boys were sitting listening to swami ji speaking informally about uh, krishna consciousness suddenly rafael spoke up expressing his doubts and revealing his distracted mind as for me he said i don't know what's happening i don't know whether a brass band is playing or what the heck is going on some of the devotees tensed he had interrupted their devotional mood rafael is very candid swami ji replied smiling as if to explain his son's behavior to the others Rafael finally fixed the lock but one day after a lecture he approached the swami stood beside the stairs and spoke up ex- exasperated impatient i am not meant to sit in a temple and chant one beats on beats my father was a boxer i am meant to run on the beach and breathe in big breaths of air rafael went on gesticulating and voicing his familiar complaints thinking he would rather do than take up krishna consciousness 
Suddenly, Prabhupada interrupted him in a loud voice. Then do it. Do it. Raphael shrank away, but he stayed. Bill Epstein took pride in his relationship with the Swami. It was honest. Although he helped the Swami by telling people about him and sending them up to see him in his apartment, he felt the Swami knew he'd never become a serious follower. Nor did Bill ever misled himself into taking into thinking he would uh, ever be serious. But Prabhupada wasn't content with Bill's taking take it or leave it attitude. When Bill would finally show up at the storefront again after spending some days at friend's place only to fall asleep with a blanket wrapped over his head during the lecture, Prabhupada would just start shouting so loud that Bill couldn't sleep. Sometimes Bill would ask a challenging question and Prabhupada would answer and then say, Are you satisfied? And Bill would look up dreamily and answer, No. Then Prabhupada would answer it again more fully and say louder, Are you satisfied? And again, Bill would say no. This would go on until Bill would have to give up, give, give in. Yes, yes, I am satisfied. But Bill was the first person to get up and dance during a kirtan in storefront. One of the other boys thought he looked like he was dancing in egoistical, narcissistical way, uh, even though his arms were outstretched in a facsimile of the pictures of Lord Chaitanya. But when Swamiji saw Bill dancing like that, he looked at Bill with wide open eyes and feelingly expressed appreciation. Bill is dancing just like Lord Chaitanya. Bill sometimes returned from his uh, wandering with the money, although it was not very uh, much. He would give it to the Swami. He, he liked to sleep at the storefront and spend the day on the street returning for lunch or kirtan or a place to sleep. He used to live, live in the uh, morning and go looking for cigarettes on the ground. To build the Swami was part of his of the hip movement and had thus earned a place of respect in his eyes as a genuine man, genuine person. Bill objected when the boy introduced signs of uh, reverential worship toward the Swami, starting with their giving him an elevated seat in the temple. And as the boys uh, who lived with Swami gradually began to show enthusiasm, competition and even rivalry among themselves, Bill turned from it in disgust. He allowed that he would go on just helping the Swami in his own way and he knew that Swami appreciated whatever he did. So he wanted to leave it at that. Karl Jagens uh, had helped Prabhupada in times of need. He had helped with the legal work of incorporating ISKCON, signed the ISKCON charter as a trustee, and even opened his home to the Swamiji when David had, written, uh, had driven him from the Bavari loft. But those days when he and Eva had shared the apartment with him had created a tension that had never left. He liked the Swami. He respected him as genuine sannyas from India, but he didn't accept the conclusions of the philosophy. The talk about Krishna and the soul was fine, but the idea of giving up drugs and sex was carrying it a little too far. Now Prabhupada was settled in his new in his new place, and Carl decided that he had done his part to help and was no longer needed. Although he had helped Prabhupada incorporating his International Society for Krishna Consciousness, he didn't want to join it. Carl found the Second Avenue Kirtans too public, not like the more intimate atmosphere he had enjoyed with Swamiji in Bavari. Now, the audience were larger and there was an element of wide letting loose that they had never had on the Bavari. Like some of the other old associates, Carl felt sheepish and reluctant to join in. In comparison to the Second Avenue street scene, the old meetings in the fourth, fr fourth floor Bavari loft had seemed more mystical than secluded meditation, like secluded meditation. Carol Becker also preferred a more sedate Kirtan. She thought 
people were trying to take out their personal frustrations by the wild singing and ch- dancing the few times she did attend evening kirtans on street second avenue for tense moments one time a group of teenagers had come into the storefront mocking and shouting hey what the hell is this she kept thinking that at the any moment a rock would a rock uh, was going to come crashing through the big window and anyway her boyfriend wasn't interested james greeny felt embarrassed he saw that most of the new men were making a serious commitment to uh, to the swami whereas silent bit up he could not so he had no bad feeling toward the swami and his new moment but he preferred to live uh, alone robert nelson propas old up, uptown friend never deviated in his good f- feelings for propas but he always went along in his own natural way and never adopted any serious disciples disciplines somehow almost all of those who had helped propath uptown and on the bowery did not want to go further once he began a spiritual organization which happened almost immediately after he moved into the 26 second avenue new people were coming forward to assist him and carl james carol and others like uh, them felt that they were being replaced and that their obligation toward the swami was ending it was a kind of changing of the guard although the members of the old guard were still his well wishers <clears throat> they began to drift away bruce schaff had just graduated from the new york city so new york university and was applying for a job one day an ex roommate told him about the swami he had visited down on second avenue they sing there his friend said and they have this far out thing where <clears throat> they have some dancing and alan gingsberg was there the swami was difficult to understand his friend explained and besides that his followers recorded his talks on a tape recorder why should he have a big tape recorder that's not very spiritual but bruce became interested he was already a devotee of indian culture Four years ago, when he ha- was barely 20, Bruce had worked during the summer as a steward aboard an American f- freighter and gone to India, where he had visited in temples, bought pictures of Shiva and Ganesh and books on Gandhi and felt as if he were part of the culture. When he returned to New York, uh, yeah, he, re- he read more about <clears throat> india and wrote a paper on gandhi for his history course he would eat in indian restaurants and attend indian f- films and music recitals and he was reading the bhagavad gita he had even given uh, up eating meat he had plans of returning to india taking some advanced college course and then coming back to america to teach eastern religions but in the meantime he was experimenting with lsd Chuck Barnett was 18 years old. His divorced mother had recently moved to Greenwich Village where she was studying psychology at uh, New York University. Chuck had moved out of his mother's apartment to one on uh, 12th Street on the Lower East Side in the neighborhood of Allen Ginsberg and other hip, hip poets and musicians. He was a progressive jazz flutist who worked with several professional groups in the city he had been practicing hatha yoga for 6 years and had recently been experimenting with lsd he would have visions of lotuses and concentric circles but after coming down he would become more involved than ever in sensuality a close friend of chucks had suddenly gone homosexual that summer leaving chuck disgusted and cynical someone told chuck that an indian swami was staying down street on second avenue and so he came one day in august to the window of the former matchless gift store steve uh, gaudino the son of a new york fireman had grown up his, the, in the city and graduated 
from Brooklyn College in 1961. Influenced by his father, he had gone into the Navy where he had tolerated two years of military routine, always waiting for the DA. He would be free to join his friends on the Lower East Side. Finally, a few months after the death of President Kennedy, he had been honorably discharged. Without so much as paying a visit to his parents, he had headed straight for the Lower East Side, which by then appeared vividly within his mind to be the most mystical place in the world. He was writing stories, stories and short novels under the literary influence of Franz Kafka and others, and he began to take LSD to search and experiment with consciousness. A Love Supreme, a record by John Coltrane's, the jazz musician, encouraged Steve to think that God actually existed. Just as to make enough money to live, Steve had taken a job with the welfare office. One afternoon during his lunch hour, while walking down 2nd Avenue, he saw that the matchless gift store had a small piece of paper in the window announcing lectures in Bhagavad Gita, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Chuck, I finally found 2nd Avenue and 1st Street and I saw through the window that there was a small ch some chanting going on inside and some people were sitting up against the wall. Beside me on the sidewalk, some middle class people were looking in and giggling. I turned to them and with my palms folded, I asked, is this where a Swami is? They giggled and said, Pilgrim, your search has ended. I wasn't surprised by this answer because I felt it was the truth. Bruce and Chuck, uh, unknowing to one another, lived only two blocks apart. After the suggestion from his friend, Bruce also made his way to the storefront. Bruce, I was looking for Hare Krishna. I had left my apartment and had walked over to Avenue B when I decided to walk all the way down to Hurston Street. When I came to 1st Street, I turned right and then walking along 1st Street, came to 2nd Avenue all along 1st Street. I was seeing these um, Puerto Ricans grocery stores and then there was uh, one of those churches where everyone was standing up, singing loudly and playing tambourines. Then, as I walked for further along 1st Street, I had the feeling that I was leaving the world like wa when you are going to airport to catch a plane. I thought, um, now I am leaving a, pa a part of, my behind, of me behind and I am going uh, to something new. But when I got over to the 2nd Avenue, I couldn't find Hare Krishna. There was a gas station and then I walked past a little storefront, but the only sign was on one, was one that said matchless gifts. Then I walked back again past the store and in the window I saw a black and white sign announcing a Bhagavad Gita lecture. I uh, entered the storefront and saw a pile of shoes there. So I took off my shoes and came in and sat down near the back. Steve, I had a feeling that this was a group that was already established and had been meeting for a while. I came in and sat down on the floor and a boy who said his name was Roy was very courteous and friendly to me. He seemed to be one uh, who had already experienced the meetings. He asked me my name and I felt at ease. Suddenly the Swami entered, uh, coming through the side door. He was wearing a saffron dhotis but no shirt. Just a piece of cloth like a long sash tied in a knot across his right shoulder and leaving his arms, his left shoulder and part of his chest bare. When I saw him, I thought of the Buddha. Bruce, there were about 15 people sitting on the floor. One man with a big beard sat up by the front on the right side, right hand side leaning up against the wall. After some time, the door on the opposite side opened and in, the, and in walked the Swami. When he came in, he turned his head to see who was in his audience. And then he, started, uh, he stared right at me. Our eyes met. It was as if he were studying me. In my mind, it was like a photograph was being taken of uh, Swamiji looking at me for the first time. There was a pause. Then he 
very gracefully got up and the dais and sat down and took out a pair of hand cymbals and began a kirtan the kirtan was a thing that most affected me it was the big best music i have ever heard and it was had meaning you could actually concentrate on it and it gave me some joy to repeat the words hare krishna i immediately accepted it as a spiritual practice chuck i entered the storefront and sitting on the grass mat on the hard floor with a person who seemed at first to be neither male nor female but when he uh, looked at me i couldn't even look him straight in his in the eyes they were so brilliant and glistering glistening his skin was golden with rose cheeks and he had large eyes that framed his face he had three strands of beads one which was at his neck one a little longer and the other down on his chest he had a long forehead which rose above his shining eyes and there were many furrows in his brow his arms were slender and long his mouth was rich and full and very dark uh, um, and red and smiling and his teeth were brighter than his eyes he sat in a cross leg position that i had never seen before in any yoga book and had never seen any yogi perform it was a sitting posture but his right foot was crossed over the thigh and um, brought back besides his left hip and the and one knee rested on the other directly in front of him his every expression and gesture was different from those of any other personality i had ever seen and i sensed that they had meanings that i didn't know from a culture and a mood that were completely beyond this world there was a mole on his side and a peculiar callus on his ankle a round color similar to what a karate expert develops on his knuckles he ha- he was dressed in unhemmed cloth dyed saffron everything about him was exotic and his whole effulgence made uh, him uh, seem to be more to be not even sitting in the room but projected from some other place he was so uh, bri- brilliant in color that it was like a technicolor movie and yet he had right there he was right there i heard him speaking he was sitting right there before me yet it seemed that if i reached out to touch him he wouldn't be there at the same time seeing him was not an abstract or subtle experience but a more intense presence after their first visit to the store front chuck steve and bruce each got an opportunity to see the swami upstairs in his apartment Steve I was on my lunch hour and had to be back in the office very soon I was dressed in a summer business suit I had planned it so that I had just enough time to go to the store front and buy some books then go to the lunch and return to work at the store front one of the swami's followers said that I could go up and see the swami I went upstairs to his apartment and found him at his sitting place where with a few boys I must have interrupted what he was saying but I asked him if I could purchase the three volumes of the Shrimad Bhagavatam one of the devotees produced the books from the closet opposite uh, uh, Prabhupada's seat I handled the books they were a very special color they were a very special color not usually seen in america a reddish natural earth like a brick and I asked him how much they cost 6 dollars each he said I took $20 out of my wallet and gave it to him. He seemed the only one to ask about the price of the books or give the money to because the none because none of the others came forward to represent him. They were just sitting back and listening to his speak to him speak. These books are commentaries on the scriptures. Uh, these books are commentaries on the scriptures. I asked trying to show that I knew something about books swamiji said yes 
they were his commentaries sitting smiling at ease swami ji was very attractive he seemed very strong and healthy when he smiled all his teeth were beautiful and his nostrils flared aristocratically his face was full with power full powerful full and powerful he was wearing an indian cloth robe and as he sat cross legged his smooth skin legs were partly exposed he wore no shirt but the upper part of his body was wrapped with an indian cloth shawl his limbs were quite slender but he had a protruding belly when i saw that swami ji was having to personally uh, handle the sale of books i did not want to bother him i quickly asked him to please keep the change from my 20 dollars i took the 12 three volumes without any bag or wrapping and was standing preparing to leave when swami ji said sit down and gestured that i should sit opposite him like the others he had said sit down in a different tone of voice it was a heavy tone and indicated that now the sale of the books was completed and i should sit with the others and listen to his speak to him speak he was offering me an important invitation to become like one of the others who i knew spent many hours with him during the day when i was usually at my job and not able to come i envied uh, their leisure in being able to learn so much from him and sit and talk intimately with him by ending the sales transaction and asking me to sit he assumed that i was in need of listening to him and that i had nothing better in the world to do than to stop everything else and hear him but i was expected back at the co- at the office i didn't want to argue but i couldn't possibly stay i am sorry i have to go i said definitely i am only on my lunch hour and as i said this i had already started to move from the door for the door and swami ji responded by suddenly breaking into a wide smile and looking very charming and very happy he seemed to appreciate that i was a working man a young man on the go i had not come by simply becoming uh, because sorry i had not come by simply because i was unemployed and had nowhere to go and nothing to do approving of my energetic demeanor he allowed me to take my leave chuck one of the devotees in the store front invited me upstairs to see the swami in private i was led out of the store front into a hallway and suddenly into a beautiful little garden with a picnic table a bird bath a bird house and a flower beds after we passed through the um, garden he came to a middle class apartment building he walked up the stairs and entered an apartment which was absolutely bare of any function furniture just white walls and a parquet floor he led me through the front room and into another room and there was the swami sitting in that same majestic spiritual presence on a thin cotton mat which was covered by a uh, cloth with little elephants printed on it and leaning back on a pillow which stood against the wall one night bruce walked home with wally and he told wally about uh, his interest in going to india and becoming a professor of oriental literature why go to india valley asked india has come here swami ji is teaching us these authentic things why go to india bruce thought valley made sense so he resolved to give up his long cherished idea or idea of going to india at least as long as he could go on visiting the swami bruce i decided to go and speak personally to swami ji so i went to the storefront i found out that he lived in an apartment in the rare building a boy told me the number and said i could just go and speak with the swami he said yes just go so i walked through the storefront and there was a little courty courtyard where some plants were growing usually in the new york there uh, there is no courtyard nothing green but this was very attractive and in that courtyard there was a boy typing at a picnic table and he looked very spiritual and dedicated i hurried upstairs and rang the bell for the apartment number 2c after a little while the door opened and it was a swami yes 
he said. And I said, I would like to speak with you. He opened the door wider and stepped back and said, yes, come. We went inside together into his sitting room and sat down facing each other. He sat behind his metal trunk desk on a very thin mat which was covered with wooden blanket like uh, cover that had fra frazzled ends and elephants decorating it. He asked me um, my name and I told him it was Bruce. And then he remarked, ah, in India during the British period there was one uh, Lord Bruce and he said something about Lord Bruce being in general and engaging in some uh, campaigns. I felt that I had a talk to the Swami to tell him my story and I actually found him interested to listen. It was very intimate, sitting with him in his apartment and he was actually wanting to hear about me. While we were talking, he looked up past me, high up on the wall behind me, and he was talking about Lord Chaitanya. The way he looked up, he was obviously looking at some picture or something, but with an expression of deep love in his eyes, I turned around uh, to see what made him look like that. Then I saw the picture in the brown frame, Lord Chaitanya dancing in Kirtan. Inevitably, meeting with Prabhupada uh, meant a philosophical discussion. We'll take a break here. We'll continue from here um, next Thursday. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Yes. Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank you for the session. I think one thing what I what I learned is I think different people approach Prabhupada in different ways. But I think they all had one thing in common that they all wanted to observe, understand and learn something through which I think, I mean, all these experiences, they have become great devotees. Yeah. Yeah. I see that um, yeah, um, uh, when, we, when we have a cultivation of a seed, right? I mean, this chapter is also entitled The Seed. Uh, yeah, it takes time mm, before we can really see a full-fledged uh, mm, happy plant. So there were so many coming and they did their part. Yeah. Just like for a, for a plant, we like the fruit and the flowers. But before that, we see a lot of leaves that, that support. And of course, the leaves will fall after, after they do their job. So there were some who thought, okay, our job is done. Yeah. And then there were some other batch who came, who were taking over. So in that way, they were still supporting Prabhupada or Iskon or yeah, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mission. Yes, Prabhuji. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rameshwar Prabhu. How are you? Okay. Maybe you're on mute or we'll talk some other time then. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Yeah, still we can't hear you, though you have unmuted. Okay. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Uh, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, His Holiness Satsvarupa Maharaj Ki Jai, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.